Good morning. How are you guys? So, where were we? Uh, so, let me see. Yes, so I left, I left like a, an exercise, no? A simple exercise, which was the following. How was the exercise? Now, so we have an ensemble of um, n times n uh, real uh, symmetric. Matrices. As I take one matrix of this ensemble A with lambda vector A, this is the spectrum. And I'm, I'm recalling formulas, right? And then I have that the empirical spectral density for A rho sub A of lambda, we saw it can be written as minus 2 divided by pi n. The limit eta go to zero plus of what? Of the, give me a second, the derivative with respect to z, the logarithm of z sub a of z, when z is equal to lambda minus i eta. And the, the imaginary part, no? The limit eta goes to zero plus, the imaginary part of this. Yeah. And then the exercise I left, it was okay. Now suppose you have a, you take a particular ensemble where you have a random recipe of picking these matrices from that ensemble. Okay. So the, 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 the exercise was uh, okay, actually let me finish this. Where for any matrix, for any symmetric real matrix, this set A of set can be written as the integral of dx, dx i divided of voilà, the product for i from 1 to n of dx i divided by the square root of 2 pi of the exponential of minus h of x, maybe sub pay, where h sub pay of x is equal to one half the sum for i and j from one to n of x i set times the identity matrix minus a components i j of the whole beast x j. And what we said is this mapping is exact, right, for any type of matrix, any type of free asymmetric matrix. So far so good? Okay, so what was the idea of the exercise? Now, we take a particular ensemble. So, uh, suppose this ensemble is the ensemble of Erdos, Reni, uh, graphs, or random graphs. And we are, what we are going to denote a given matrix like C, okay? Uh, C you know, belongs to, and this C is what is called the connectivity or adjacency matrix. Connectivity or adjacency matrix. We're going to, we're going to assume that the, these graphs are Undirected. That means that this matrix is symmetric. That means Cij is equal to Cji. We're going to assume that there are no cell loops. And the probabilistic rule is the following. The probability that Cij is equal to 1. That means that I take two nodes i and j, and they are connected by a link. This is equal to d divided by n. Sorry, the values that this guy takes, sorry, is 0, 1. And therefore, the probability that c i j is equal to 0 is 1 minus d divided by n. Right? Good. 
And uh, you one can show that this D means is the average connectivity of the, of the graph. Uh, this is the average Right? And then I give you this ensemble and I ask, for this ensemble, calculate the following. For this ensemble, I want you to calculate so given a, now a C, given C from this ensemble, the, we know there is a map, exact map that tells you that the spectral, empirical spectral density for a given C is the formula I put here. Let me just put it again. Uh, the logarithm of set, C of set, set equal to lambda minus I eta. But then what I wanted you to do is to calculate the expectation value with respect to this random rule you have for the ensemble. So I want you to calculate the expectation value of this. Well, what this thing means, yeah, this bar means the following. Now I have a rule that tells you what is the probability of taking one of these connectivity matrices at random from the ensemble. So this would mean in this case the sum over all possible values of a matrix, of course, taking into account these, con these constraints of the probability of observing a given value for this uh, connectivity matrix times rho, right? Okay? So this is just a definition of what is an expectation value, right? The only thing difference is like now the random variables are take values zero, zeros and ones, and instead of putting here an integral, I put a sum. And what this sum, what in principle means, is I have to sum over all possible values of the entries of the connectivity matrix. Of course, taking into account that the matrix has to be symmetric, and for simplicity, I, I remove the diagonal terms. I put them to zero. So far, so good. Yeah. But of course, what I want to do, I want to do this expectation value using the formula above. So that means that at the end of the day, or the important thing I have to do the quench average over is precisely the logarithm of the partition function associated to this problem. So this is the important piece I need to, to, the, to calculate, to derive. So using the replica trick, I know that this I can evaluate it as follows. This is equal to the limit. Uh, n go to zero, one divided by n, the logarithm of the nth power of the partition function, and then average over the, this uh, rule, uh, probabilistic rule for these ensembles of erdos Renyi graphs. So far, so good? Yeah? Very good. So, this means that now I have to focus on this object here, right? So let's take now this piece. So I have the n power of the partition function. I like we consider first an integer. So this is equal to what? This is equal to what it is. So what it is is, OK, so the formula I put for c, there is a 1 divided by a square root of 2 pi. But this is a constant that plays no role. I'm not going to put it anymore, right? So this is equal to what? This is equal to? the integral over d n x. I'm using now this notation. d n x is equal to the product for i d x i. Yeah? Of uh, the uh, exponential of minus h sub c of x, where h sub c of x is given by the mapping that we have, right? So this is equal to minus one half of x transpose that multiplies to c identity matrix, no identity matrix, 
just sorry, identity matrix minus C L X. Right? To the power N, N integer. So far, so good? Can you speak up? Yeah, but I said, I, I, I just said that since this is an irrelevant constant, I'm going to forget it, right? So you're right, but either, uh, so you can forget it because here you have the logarithm, and then you have this derivative. So this constant, it, it will disappear, so that's why I'm not writing it anymore. But you cannot forget it. You have to do the, the whole bloody derivation with all the constants and then realize which, which ones are important and which ones are not important. Good, so this is equal to what? Well, this is equal to the integral product and time. So let us do it. I'm going to do this in, uh, I'm going to do all this step by step. Okay, so this is equal to what? So the integral. And then times again the same integral. And this up to n times, no? Right? Again, bear with me a second because I've been discussing with some of you and I think these steps, to do these steps explicitly is very important. Because here there are certain things that some of you didn't do correctly, right? So again, so this object of power n, this object is just in this case an integral is the object multiplied n times, right? Now, since the x's are dummy variables because they are integration variables, let me call, you, can, you could call this one x and keep it like this, you could call it y said you could change it, right? But this will not be very efficient from the point of view of notation, so I'm going to call this one x1, this x2, x3, etc. right? So this is equal to dn x1 exponential minus the Hamiltonian c x1. But notice here, that this, this integral, there is something which is free, it's not dummy, which is the value of the, of, the, of the matrix. So I'm integrating over x, I'm not integrating so far over the matrix, right? So these, all these integrals, they share the same matrix. So here I cannot put an index one, that doesn't make any sense, because this is not a, a dummy object, this is a free object, right? So I'll call this one dnx1 with x1, and then dn x2 exponential of minus Hamiltonian c x2, x2, sorry, up to dn x sub small n exponential of minus h c x n, right? n copies of the system, but all of them they share the same matrix. All right? So now this, I can use notation to put this thing in a compact, compact form, okay? So this, I write this as a product for alpha from one to n, d, n, x vector alpha, of the exponential of minus the sum for alpha from 1 to n, Hamiltonian C, x alpha. And again, this C doesn't have any alpha, okay? Because it's shared by the same, by all matrices. So far, so good? Very good. And now for this object, so let's put it back here. Notice how I do derivations. I do it piece by piece, right? And step by step, which is a very healthy thing to do. Now I have arrived to what? To the fact that the nth power of the partition function is equal to this, to this integral to the uh, to the product for alpha from one to a small n, dn x sub alpha alpha of the exponential of minus the sum for alpha from one to a small n 
of the Hamiltonian sub C x alpha. Yeah. And so far so good, yes? Very good. Now I have to do the average over the different realizations of C. And this is denoted with this over line, right? So what is C in this case is here, so I have to do the average over this. And remember that this average means what I, what I, what I put before, right? So now let me forget about this whole piece. I'm, I'm going to focus on this. So I have to do the expectation value with respect to the ensemble of matrices of this object. So let's remem remember again what is this thing for the, by definition. This is equal to the sum for all possible matrix entries of the probability of realizing a given connectivity matrix of the exponential of minus voilà, the sum for alpha from 1 to n of h c x alpha, right? And now I just start putting, uh, putting definitions, no? Okay, so this is equal to what? The sum over all possible values of the connectivity matrix of P of C of the exponential of minus one half the sum for alpha from one to n, the sum for i and j from one to capital N of xi alpha, xi alpha, uh, set times the identity matrix minus c entries ij x uh, j alpha. Good. Now, C is here, and I have to do the average over the matrix entries, okay? So I'm going to focus on that part, and then I will gather all, all the results. So let us focus on that part. Now. So, I have what? I have uh, the exponential. Again, I'm going to focus. This is not an equality. I'll focus in the part which is important right now, which is this part here, right? So this is equal to the exponential of one half. Or actually, let me focus first in the part of the argument of the exponential. So I have one half of the sum for alpha from one to n, the sum for i and j from 1 to capital N of what? Of x i alpha c i j x j alpha. Okay? Good? Now, remember that we have this condition that uh, c i j is equal to c j i and c i i is equal to 0. This is hidden in the definition. It's enforced by the, either by the definition of this probability, or you can just uh, impose it directly in this expression. Okay? So since the diagonals are, are zero, because it's our choice of so there are no cell loops, right? To so simplify derivations, this is equal to what? It's equal to one half the sum alpha from one to n, the sum for i and j, but i different than j of x i alpha c i j x j alpha. So here I'm imposing that c i i are equal to zero. Good. Now, since this uh, the matrix is symmetric, this is equal to what? This is equal to uh, the sum for alpha from one to a small n and the sum for i is smaller than j of x i alpha c i j x j alpha. And here I'm imposing that c i j is equal to c j i. Is that okay? Do you see this step or shall I do it with a couple of more steps? Is, is okay? Very good, so that means the following, that now I have to do the expectation value of, we, of what? I have to do the, uh, the sum over C, P, C, 
of the exponential of the sum over alpha from 1 to a small n, the sum for i is smaller than j, of a x, x i alpha, c i j, x j alpha. Now, so far so good? Uh, this is equal to what? This is equal to the sum over all values of c of p c of the product for i smaller than j of the exponential of the sum for alpha from 1 to a small n of, uh, let me put it like this, of c i j, the sum for alpha from 1 to n replicas of x i alpha x j alpha. I have not done anything, the only thing I've done is to put this sum as a product in front of the exponential. Yeah? But now, since I'm focusing in one of the, I'm focusing on the independent variables of the connectivity matrix, okay? So all these things factorized, I only have to do expectation value for, for one of the matrix entries. So this is equal to the product for i smaller than j of the sum for c i j of what? Actually, let me, I'm going to go there. It's better, right? So this is equal to what? Mm. So I continue here. So this is equal to the product for i smaller than j, the sum over c i j when text values are either 0 or 1, of what? Of d divided by n, Kronecker delta c i j 1, plus 1 minus d divided by n, Kronecker delta c i j 0, of this exponential, right? Exponential of c i j, the sum for alpha from 1 to n replicas of x i alpha x j alpha. And then I do the sum because this sum takes two values, right? This would be equal to the product for i is smaller than j. And then when c is 0, here I have 1 multiplied by this, right? And when c is 1, I have this, this weight multiplied by the exponential with this one, right? So this equal to uh, 1 minus d over n plus d over n, exponential of the sum for alpha from 1 to n of x i alpha x j alpha. So far so good? Very good. And this, I can write it as follows. I can write it as, with a modest amount of foresight, because I'm thinking ahead in the following step of the, of the derivation, this I write it as follows, right? So I write it as, the product for i is smaller than j of 1 plus d divided by n that multiplies the exponential. And let me simplify this notation using the, this notation of the vectors in the replica space. So this would be x i vector in the replica space, a scalar product with x vector in the replica space j minus 1, where we have introduced this notation. If I say x with the arrow or whatever below. This is x1 up to x small n. Good. And this equal to what? This is equal to the exponential of the log of this, but the log of this, which is a product, is the sum of the log. The sum for i smaller than j the log of 1 plus d divided by n, exponential of the scalar product xi xj minus 1. Good. And since some po at some point I'm interested in the limit from uh, when n, n goes to infinity for very large matrices, I can do a Taylor expansion of the, of, uh, 
of this part here because this is small when n goes to infinity and just keep the leading terms. So this will give me the exponential of d divided by m, the sum for i smaller than j of uh, the exponential of xi vector xj vector minus 1 uh, plus terms that go like n to the 0 or smaller. Good? Now, this, 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 this object here is symmetric under the exchange of i and j. So what I can do, I can symmetrize this sum. So I mean, the step I'm doing is the following, right? So suppose I have an object with, which is symmetric under the, the exchange of two indices. Maybe, maybe I'm being too explicit with this. So suppose you have something like this where this is a, an object which is symmetric under the exchange of i and j. But the, only thing, the only step I'm doing right now is the following. Okay, So this is equal to what? This is equal to, I write this thing as one half, the same thing, right? Plus one half. I have not done anything. Here, now, for instance, in this second piece, I, I, I interchange i and j because they are dummy variables. So this would be equal to one half sum i is more than j is i j plus one half of the sum i uh, bigger than j is j i. But this is a symmetric ob object, so this is equal to s i j. And what I have, what I have is actually one half of the sum for all i and j, but i different than j, because I'm missing the diagonal part of this, right? It's just that. So I do this thing here, and this is equal to, so this is equal to the exponential of d divided by 2n, the sum for i different than j, for all i and for all j, i different than j, of the exponential of x vector i, a scalar product with x vector j, minus 1, plus terms which are ordered n to the 0. What's up? Ah, OK, because this is a double sum for i that goes from 1 to n, and j goes from, from, from 1 to n. OK, so this, what is in front, so this will produce n times n minus 1 divided by two terms, right? So this, this sum will produce n times n divided by n times n minus 1 divided by two terms, right? So this is proportional, for n large, it's proportional to n square. When you do the Taylor expansion, the first term would be 1 over n. So the sum with this 1 over n will be something which is proportional to n. The next term in the Taylor expansion will have something that is 1 divided by n square. So 1 over n squared times in the sum that has n squared terms is order, is order n to the 0. Yeah? Good. More questions? Now, what I can do, so remember, this is not the complete double sum. It's missing the diagonal, but I can add and subtract the diagonal. And the diagonal, diagonal is, oh, is also order n to the 0. So this is equal to the exponential of d divided by 2n, the complete sum for i and j from 1 to n, of the exponential of the scalar product xi with xj minus 1, plus terms which are ordered n to the 0. Questions so far? Very good. Now, if I put everything together, well, up to a given point, so what do I have? I have a 
I put everything together, I have what? I have that the, the partition function to the power n and average over this ensemble of graphs is equal to what? It's equal to the integral, a bunch of integrals for all variables and all replicas. Of what? Of the exponential. Now, in the Hamiltonian that gave the mapping, there was the diagonal part that I'm going to put back. We have minus z divided by 2, the sum for alpha from 1 to small n, the sum for i from 1 to capital N of x i alpha squared. Yeah. Plus, or times, the the, 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 the result, the term that resulted from doing the average over the uh, statistics of, uh, of, of uh, erdos Rangi graphs, and that gave this, right? Plus t divided by 2n, sum i and j from 1 to n of the exponential of x vector i scalar product with x vector j minus 1. And I'm, I'm not going to write down this thing anymore, right? Good? Tell me. How I go from here to here? Yeah, let me do it step by step. It's fine. Yeah? So what I do is the following. What I do. So this is equal. Let's do it step by step d divided by 2n, I have the sum for i, for all i and j, but i different than j of this object, right? Exponential of this scalar product, minus 1. And I'm going to add a 0 to this expression, but in a smart way to achieve something, right? So what I do is I add plus d divided by 2n, the sum for i from 1 to n, of the exponential of x i a scalar product with xi minus 1 minus the same term, the sum for i from 1 to n of the exponential of xi a scalar with xi minus 1. And remember that I have terms of order n to the 0. So far, so good? Where are you? Ah, yeah. So far, so good? Yeah. This term that I, I, I have added and subtracted. When I put it here, I complete the sum, yeah? And then the other piece, okay, that I added, so I, what I do is to sum uh, for zero, this is order n to the zero. Why? Because you have a sum of n terms divided by n. So this is subleading when s n goes to infinity, yeah? Of course, when you are going to do perturbation theory, all this is very important. But we're not going to do the perturbation theory. Good. So that's it? Yes, but uh, in general, why we are not taking a convention uh, Why, sorry? Why we are not taking a convention? Because to, the, to, 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 to get to an expression of the typical behavior of the spectral density for very large matrices, you only need the leading terms in the, in the system size. The subleading terms will give you uh, the corrections when you want to take into account the, the, fin uh, the fact that the matrix may be finite, not infinitely large. More questions? Go ahead. This notation yeah, means it's a generic ve vector in replica space. It's x1 up to x small n, and in, n is the number of replicas. If I put something like this, this is a vector in the, in the replica space at node or site i. So this will mean the following, right? So this, is, this means xi1 up to xi. Good. 
I know that the uh, journal notation can be a bit annoying, but you have to get used to this, is because otherwise, the, if you want to write down this thing explicitly, it's, it's, it's even more annoying. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, we had a sum. We have the sum for, yeah, this came, actually this part came for the sum of alpha from one to n of x, i, alpha, x, i, alpha. Since I'm a bit lazy, at least today, I wanted to get rid of the sum and I use the, the notation of the scalar product. More questions? You'll see why. I'm foreseeing further in the derivation that I'll need to have the complete sum, yeah? The only reason I'm, I'm adding this term is, that, so again, this notation here means the sum for all i and j, but i different than j. I am adding the diagonal, so I have the complete double sum. Yeah? Very good, more questions, guys? That's it? Very good, so now I have this. And the next step has nothing to do with uh, random matrices or uh, spin glasses. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, okay, actually, let, let me spend some time on this, okay? Then the, the next trick has nothing to do with the spin glasses. Uh, so. Can I ask you another question on the, on yeah? the Taylor expansion? Because uh, they, we are expanding, uh, usually when we expand the logarithm in that, uh, in that form, it's a like logarithm of one plus something small, no? You have d divided by n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, okay. Th this is true because you have a lot of them, but uh, so you do the expansion of the logarithm and then you have the sum in front of the logarithm. Ah, so we can expand all of them. Yeah. Okay. And then in the end, the first term would be something which is proportional to n, considering the one over n that is inside of the argument of the log and the double sum. Yeah? So, so you see, so you're right. So you have to be a bit careful sometimes with this. You, so, so you have like a, the sum for i is smaller than j and you have something like the logarithm of 1 plus let's say x divided by n, yeah? So you can do the expansion of this. Of course this grows and this, right? But, uh, so uh, actually funnily enough, if this will not be in the sum, if this would be here, and then you make the limit, this is the, the, the limit of an exponential of something, which at the end is what you get, right? More questions? Okay, so the next, the next trick, sorry, has nothing to do with spin glasses or random matrices or whatever. It's a trick that one should learn in a statistical mechanics or in condensed matter, which is the following, right? So forget about what we have done so far. So suppose I'm going to write down the same H for Hamiltonian, but this is a different Hamiltonian. This is just a general comment, yeah? So suppose I have something like this. I have a Hamiltonian. I'm going to put discrete variables for, for simplicity. I have this. Right? Questions? Okay, I'm going to explain a very important trick, actually. Right? And given this Hamiltonian, I want to calculate the uh, partition function. The, so the partition function is equal to the sum over all configurations of the exponential of minus beta h of sigma, right? So again, forget about what we have done so far. Yeah, this is about the stack mech and tricks in stack mech. Now, if I have a Hamiltonian which is linear in the thermal variables, the partition function is. Sorry. If you want to put it in this, this context, yes, but now it's simply a Hamiltonian that depending on the context can mean different things. It doesn't matter. Yeah, if you want to put, to put it in the context that these uh, sigmas are spin variables and therefore these thetas are the external local magnetic fields, it's fine by me, but this has nothing to do with what I'm going, what I'm, I want to explain. It's just to put uh, some formulas, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'll just come back to you there. Sure. Why, why it, it appear here? Because if you go, you, you go back to the different pieces I analyze and you put everything together, 
right? Then you end up here. Yeah, so, okay, so shall we do it? So remember in the derivation, so, so, so normally when you do difficult derivations, it's better to isolate certain pieces and say, okay, I have, now I have to analyze this and then this and then this. And I have I've put the pieces uh, separately and then I put everything together in the average of the replicated partition function and the end result is this. Yeah, which are because remember in the Hamiltonian guys, remember that in the Hamiltonian of that gives the mapping, there was a diagonal term that didn't contain C or the, the, the connectivity matrix. This diagonal term was this one, right? And when I was doing the average over the, the C's, I said, okay, I'm going to forget about that part and I'm going only to focus on the part where C is. And I did that piece, right? And then you have to go back, gather all the pieces, and at the end you got this. Ah, the N0, but I said, sorry, I said that I, I was not going to write that thing anymore. Ah, okay, just forget about the diagonal. But yeah, but I said that, I said, I'm not going to write this in this term. If, I mean, if you want, you can put it, but, okay, I have plus terms which has order. You mean this? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah? Okay. That's it? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. More questions? I know that this derivation is annoying and difficult, but uh, it's okay. Ask any, as many questions as you want. So can I continue with this? Right? Okay. So suppose that you have a Hamiltonian. It doesn't matter which context. Okay? But it's a linear Hamiltonian in the sense it's a linear, it's linear in the variables I have to do the traceover. Yeah? And I have to evaluate the partition function, and this is very easy to do. Right? Why? Because this, I can write it as... Okay, let us do it step by step. So this is equal to what? The sum over sigma 1 times the sum over sigma 2 up to the sum over sigma n. So let's say that we have n variables here. Of the exponential of minus, let me put here a minus to cancel the two minus, right? Beta uh, theta 1 sigma 1 plus beta theta 2 sigma 2 up to beta theta theta n, sigma n, right? The exponential of the sum is pro product of exponential, so I, ca I can distribute each term in front of the, its sum, and this would be what? This would be the sum over sigma 1, the exponential of uh, beta, theta 1, h1, times the sum over sigma 2, the exponential of beta, theta 2, sigma 2, up to the sum over sigma n, the exponential of beta, theta, n, sigma n. Yeah? And this is equal to what? So, so this is equal to, or I can put this thing in a compact form. I can say this is equal to the product of i from 1 to n of the sum over sigma i, the exponential of beta, theta i, sigma i. But this sum is very easy to do. It's two times the hyperbolic cosine of beta, theta i. times the hyperbolic cosine of beta theta i, and this is the result of the partition function. Yeah? Good? Now, suppose now I have, this would be one example, I'm going to continue here maybe. Suppose now I have now different Hamiltonian. Uh, where I have a linear term. and something which is quadratic. And again, it does not depend on the context. It doesn't matter. You know, sum over i and j, whatever, of j i j, sigma i, sigma j. Yeah? Good? So now, I cannot, I cannot use this trick. I cannot factorize, because here this double sum would be like a double product, and it's very difficult. Dif uh, you cannot apply this, this trick directly. You all agree with me. Yeah? So many of the tricks when analyzing or deriving or evaluating partition functions related to models is to find ways of convert this thing, this quadratic form, into a linear form. And when I say quadratic, it could be cubic, because maybe you have, instead of having pairwise interactions, you have trivial interactions, four-body interactions, et cetera, et cetera, right? So for instance, mean field theory 
Have you heard about mean field theory? So mean field theory is an approximation that you do here. Like this it has some kind of physical interpretation. Physical intuition is a, is a manipulation that you do here to convert this double sum into a single sum. Yeah? So in some cases, you can do an exact manipulation of this to convert it into a single sum. In other cases, you would do an approximation. For the models we are discussing, you can do this in exactly. You don't have to do an approximation. Okay? So now, I know that this beast is very, very scary for you, but let us analyze a model where you can use this trick of linearizing this double sum exactly, and the idea translate directly to this. Good? Tell me. You, we're having what, sorry? We're having a quadratic area. But it's, yeah? So I don't know if it is very good for a linear one. Or no, good, good, good. Okay, Th thanks for the question. It's, it's very important. When I, when I mean linear, I mean linear in the sums of the dynamical variables that appear in the Hamiltonian, right? So of course, this is quadratic, but I, I don't mean this. I don't mean this sum that appears here. This is a linear behavior with the some kind of function that depends on the variables, this quadratic in variables, right? If, if, you were if you were to have here something like uh, some function here, okay, whatever the function is, this is still linear in this context I'm, I'm, I'm describing. And of course you can, you can mention, you, you can understand that, like for instance, if this would be instead of, uh, it's in variables, would be what, what they are called pol uh, POTS variables that they take discrete values, for instance, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, of course, I can put here a, a, a given power, for instance, power 2 or power 3 or power 4, doesn't matter. And this whole trick applies. Why? Because what is important is the fact that the Hamiltonian is, is linear, is linear in the sum of functions of the thermal variables. Very good question. More questions? Right? Okay, so let me, let me explain you the trick in a, sim, sim, in a simple model, and this model is gonna be, again, the easy model, because everybody is obsessed with the easy model. <laughs> but we're going to consider the fully connected easy model, right? Consider the fully connected model. So the fully connected DC model is an easy model where all the spins are connected to each other. Right, it's as simple as that. So the Hamiltonian of the fully connected DC model is the following. H of sigma is minus J divided by uh, N. The sum for I is smaller than J, sigma I, sigma J, and maybe you, you also have magnetic fields, right? Uh, external, external, external magnetic fields. So let's put this thing as minus h sum for i from 1 to n sigma i, right? So far so good? And this, again, if you, this notation means the double sum for i and j, but i is more than j. Are you with me? Have we seen these sums before? Yeah. They appear, right? So the tricks I'm going to do is some tricks I learned when I was a kid, when I was very young, in kindergarten, right? So I need to evaluate the partition function of this model, which is the sum over all possible configurations of the exponential of minus beta h of sigma, right? So this is equal to what? So this is equal to the sum over all possible configurations of the exponential of beta j n the sum for i is smaller than j, sigma i, sigma j, plus beta capital, capital H, the sum over i from 1 to capital N of sigma i. All right? So far, so good? Tell me. You just why you by n. Very good. You have to divide by n because you want this equivalent. If you, would, if you were to do the expectation value of this, 
This is what is related to the, what is called internal energy in thermodynamics, and you want the internal energy to be extensive yeah, with the system size and somehow to have a non-trivial non -trivial behavior. So again, so here you have of the other n squared terms. Here you have n terms. If you don't overscale this thing by, by one divided by n, this will nom dominate over this one. So you want both terms to be proportional to n. That's why you, you divide by n. Very good. More questions? Right, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, this is I'm going to do exactly the same derivations I did to uh, complete this double sum. Yeah? So let's do it here carefully, right? So I focus on this piece inside the argument. I have the sum, or let me put it, uh, let me put the whole, uh, I have in the first term in the argument of the exponential is, is j, a beta j divided by n, the sum for i is more than j, sigma i, sigma j, and this is equal to what? This is equal to beta j divided by 2n, the sum for all i and j, but i different than j, of sigma i, sigma j, yeah? Good. I have not done anything because this is a symmetric object with respect to i and j, so therefore I complete the lower triangular, the lower part of the sum, and I divide by two. And then I add and subtract the diagonal term. So I put here that is plus beta j divided by 2m, the sum for i from 1 to n sigma i squared minus beta j divided by 2n, the sum for i from 1 to n j i square. Now, in this case, j i square, sorry, j i square, sigma i square, sorry, I'm a bit tired. Sigma i square is one, so this would be a trivial constant, but if this were not one, right, for instance, if the isim, uh, if the isim variables would take values, different values, like for instance, zero, one, okay, this is not one, but still, regarding the behavior with, with, of the system size, this order n zero, okay? So I'm going to neglect this, this part. So this part, I put it here to complete the double sum. So I have now this beta j divided by 2n. Now I have the complete double sum for i and j from 1 to n, sigma i, sigma j, plus terms which are order of n0. It's the same thing I did before. Yeah? Good? Very good. Now. I come back here and I put that, no, I have that this is, actually let me do here one more step. Now this I can write as follows, right? I can write this thing as beta j divided by two, and here I have the complete double sum, yeah? And one index i is with sigma i, and the other index j is with sigma j. So this I can write as follows. I can write as the sum over i from 1 to n of sigma i, the sum over j from 1 to n of sigma j. You agree? Yeah. And then anticipating that I'm going to do certain manipulations, let me here divide by 1 over n, here by 1 over n, and I multiply here by an n. And of course, this is the same object as square, right? So this is equal to beta j divided by two times n, that multiplies one over n, the sum of i from one to n, sigma i squared. So far, so good? So still, the double sum is here. Now I put the double sum as a single sum square. Notice that if instead of having uh, two bad interactions, I would have three bad interactions, four bad interactions, p bad interaction, right? At the end of the day, what I would have here is, is to the power p for p bad interaction for a fully connected model. So now that means if I follow here the division, that this is equal to the trace over all possible configurations of the the exponential of b 
beta j divided by 2 times n, and then I have here 1 over n, the sum for i from 1 to n of sigma i squared plus beta h, the sum of i from 1 to n of a sigma i. So still I have not done anything because here the double sum, I have it here, so still I cannot factorize. From, from this to here, okay, let us do it, very good. So this notation means that now I have the complete double sum. So actually what this thing means, I have the sum, the sum for i from 1 to n, and the sum for j from 1 to n. Yeah? So if I plug this in over here, sigma i, sigma j, so you know, I can put sigma i with his, with his sum and sigma j with his sum, right? So at the end of the day, I have the same sum squared. So this would be equal to, again, beta j divided by 2 times n. And I put a beautiful 1 over n inside the sum for convenience later on. 1 over n, the sum for i from 1 to n sigma i squared. Good. More questions? <sighs> Can I continue? Yes. Now, I have not done anything. And apparently, with this derivation, you start to complicate, to complicate your life, to torture yourself. But you have a, a goal. And a goal is, once I have this, now, this is very, you can linearize this thing very easily. How you do it? You introduce a Dirac delta to take this beautiful object outside of the square. And then you introduce a Fourier representation of the Dirac delta. As simple as that. Okay, so let's do it step by step. Because at the end of the day, all these derivations rely on the same observations, but the objects to which you apply these tricks are a bit more involved. But the idea is always, always the same. Okay, so now you see, let me do the following. So I continue this one here. So I have equal the sum over all possible spin configurations, and I'm going to introduce an integral over m of the exponential of beta j n divided by 2 times m squared plus beta h the sum for i from 1 to n sigma i. And I put here a beautiful Dirac delta that tells me that m must be to, the, must be to what I, I had here. No? n minus 1 over n, the sum i from 1 to n, sigma i. So again, it appears that I'm complicating, complicating my life because I'm making this object much more, this, this derivation much more, with many more terms, right? So again, I have not done anything. If I were to use the property of the Dirac delta, what would happen is like I would replace m here by this term here, and now you obtain this, right? I have not done anything. Yeah. But the beauty now is the following, and I, I can introduce a Fourier representation of the Dirac delta. So this would be equal to the sum over all possible configurations, the integral over m, now m hat divided by 2 pi, of uh, 2 pi divided by n, okay? Of the exponential of what? Of beta j to n m squared plus beta h sum over i from 1 to n sigma i plus i n m hat that multiplies n minus 1 over n, the sum for i from 1 to n of sigma i. And all of us, what's up? Ah, put it in front. Ah, okay. So, okay, I could introduce the full representation of the Dirac delta in the standard way, like this. But if you carry on the derivation, yeah, and then you apply side point method, that is where we are going, you realize that to have a non trivial solution, m hat has to be proportional to the system size. Okay, so it's just a change of variables. Yeah, it's a change of variables. It's because this is an integration variable, right? So I introduce a, an integration variable that is proportional to n. 
so that it appears here. Because I. Yeah, 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 in, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it and actually leave it as an exercise, okay? So do it with the normal conjugated variable, which would be m hat without n here. Do the whole derivation, and then you get to a side point equation, and the side point equation tells you, ah, wait a second, to have a non trivial solution, so that all terms are, are proportional to the system size, m hat must be, according to the side point equations, proportional to n, the number of variables. Since I know in advance, you know this, because I've done these calculations a gazillion times, I always put that thing over there. But since if, if it is the first time you do it, please do it carefully. Yeah, but that's the reason behind it. Very good. More questions? Go ahead. So I guess that if you don't put the end, then it's, uh, we, this term would matter. But, but then, so if you do the change of variable, you would have an n in the. Yeah, but the, sure. But, but you see, this is the beauty of exponentials and things outside the exponential, right? If I have here an n, so inside the exponential, this is uh, this term is proportional to n, proportional to n, proportional to n, and you would say, what happened with this? Well, I can put it inside the exponential, but it would appear as a log of n. Log of n grows, not, is not linear in n. So in the thermodynamic limit, you know, this term will win over this one. Very good. <laughs> but you see, all this, all this you have to do very carefully and realize after a painful derivations that certain you know, constants are not important, and sometimes and other times they are. Can I continue? Yeah? Where was I? Ah, OK. So yeah, so now, so apparently we have complicated the derivation for some no reason whatsoever. But look what, what, what happened now, right? So we started with a Hamiltonian, which is linear in the sum of thermal variables and quadratic. And by doing this manipulation, we have linear, linear. So this is linear with the, with the thermal variables. This is linear with the thermal variables. We pay the price of converting the quadratic sum into linear, having an integral. But now, since I would be able to factorize this and do the trace over the spins, at the end of the day, I'm winning. Why I'm winning? Because in the original definition of the partition function, after the, after the sum over 2 to the n terms when n goes to infinity, right? That's a lot of terms. So I'm trading that by two integrals. So at the end of the day, I'm winning. And on top of that, these two integrals can be evaluated by the side point method. Clear? So it, it appears that I have com complicated matters, but this is not true in the thermodynamic limit. That's why this trick is so cool. Yeah? So can I continue? Go ahead. From this one yes. to this one, yes. very good. The only thing I'm, I'm doing is the following. Well, the, 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 the trick I'm using is the following one. Yeah? So OK, this is, these are very good questions, because these tricks, okay, they are standard, but sometimes you don't see them. And, and again, they are very powerful. Okay? So please ask as many questions as you need. So the only trick we are, the, the trick we are, we are doing is the following. So I have a function that where the argument is something I desire, right? It doesn't matter the function. In this case, our function is the exponential, which is a, has beautiful properties. But I have a function of something I desire, and this m of sigma is a function of sigma, right? The only trick I'm using is the following, is that this, I can write it as an integral over a variable m of this function if you want, let me call it x of f of x and the real delta of x minus m of sigma. Right? So from here, well, from the step before to here, what I've done is to use this, this identity. Good. More questions? Um, yes, sorry. I am, um... No, sorry. It's okay. Linear in the sums of, of, of dynamical variables. You see, I have here a linear sum over sigma i, and here I have a linear sum over sigma i. I don't have any more double sums for the variables. I don't have 
the sum over i and j of sigma i, sigma j. No, we had it, yeah. We had it before because if I go back, here I have a linear sum a square. So that's a double sum, and the point is like this, I cannot factorize it easily to calculate very easily, the, uh, to calculate in a straightforward manner the partition function, that's the point. So, I mean, if I go back, right, and, and do all the, all the derivations, I go, and I go to the original Hamiltonian, I cannot directly factorize the arguments of the exponential in front of the trace over the... the the states of the system. Yeah? So, I mean, you can try, no? So, for instance, again, so suppose I have, a, I have the sum over sigma of the exponential of beta, sum for i, and you can put it like this, i and j, sigma i, sigma j. So, this is not true, right? So, how can I, how can I do this? I, I don't know how to continue, right? So the idea is like I want to linearize this to be able to factorize the sum over all possible configurations. Better? Very good. More questions? Go ahead. Can you speak up? Ah, well, if you want, I can do it more. Uh, one more step, if this will help. Um, Yes, so let's do one more step. Very good. Uh, let, me, let me do it there, okay? So what we have is the following. Well, maybe let's do it as follows. I'm going to use... Uh, I'm going to use the following property of the Dirac Delta in the sense of distributions. This one. That the function f of x multiplied by Dirac Delta of x minus a is equal in the sense of distributions of f of a dirac delta x minus a, right? No, 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 no. You, you mean uh, to 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 go from there to the uh, to, to go from here to here? Yeah. Ah, okay. You just put a, a, a okay. Sorry, let's do that. So what I do is that the, I write down the Dirac delta of n uh, minus the sum, 1 over n, the sum for i from 1 to n sigma i as follows, right? dm hat divided by 2 pi over n of the exponential of i n m hat n minus 1 over n sum i from 1 to n of sigma i. This is, what, this is what you are asking? Yeah, you do the of variables? No, the only thing I, 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 I've done is instead of, instead of my uh, conjugate variable to be m hat, it's m hat times n. Okay. The only problem is like I put here 1 over n. Okay. So I, I put this in the denominator of the denominator, okay? If you want, you can put it here. It doesn't matter. Well, n is the number of variables. Okay. It's the only thing I've done, yeah? Again, if you don't like that, do the standard thing, carry on the derivation I'm going to do, and at the end of the day, you realize that to, in order to have a non-trivial solution, n hat must be proportional to n. Since I know this thing in advance, because it's all the time like this in this table of derivations, I put it, uh, I put it from the beginning. Very good, more questions? Yeah, okay, so. I put this expression over here again, and I have what? I have the sum over all possible configurations of the integral over m, m hat, divided by 2 pi n of the exponential, the exponential of beta j n divided by 2 m hat plus beta capital H, the sum i from 1 to n sigma i plus i n m hat n minus 1 over n sum i from 1 to n sigma i. Now, so far, everybody is cool with this. 
One, two, three. Very good. Now, next step, I simply rearrange terms. I notice, and I want to do the trace over sigmas. No, sigma is here. Sigmas are here and here, and this is now linear, so I can factorize, right? So this is equal. This is equal to the integral over m over m hat two pi divided by n of the exponential. Let me put first the terms that depend on m and m hat. This would be beta j divided by two n m square plus i n m hat m and then a half times the trace or the sum of all possible configurations of the exponential of what? Of beta h sum i from 1 to n sigma i, and then this term over here, right? Which is minus i m hat uh, sigma the sum over i from 1 to n of sigma i. Right. So far, so good. And this now is very easy to do. Right? So this now is equal to what? This is equal to the integral over m n hat divided by 2 pi divided by n of the exponential of beta j divided by 2 m squared plus i n m hat m. And this would be, shall I do it again step by step? Maybe yes. Right. This would be equal to the product i from 1 to n of the sum over sigma i of the exponential of beta h minus i m hat sigma i. And if you, you you were going to ask me, which is a good, also a very good question. Isaac, you have here an imaginary unit. Okay, this is weird. So what happens is at the saddle point tells you that uh, I am hat must be real. Okay, but we'll see this thing. Or I'll let it, I will let it as an exercise. Now this is very easy too, right? Because this now is two times the hyperbolic cosine of beta h minus I m hat to the power n, right? And this, I can write it as the exponential n times the log of this. And I put it inside the argument of the exponential. So this is equal at the end of the day of integral mm hat divided by 2 pi n of the exponential of beta j divided by 2, I'm missing here an n, m squared n m squared plus i n m hat m plus n times the logarithm of two times the hyperbolic cosine of beta h minus i m. Right? Now, let us recapitulate because we, we, it's, it's, Easy to get lost in what we are trying to achieve. Ah, I deleted that one. It doesn't matter. So, so we managed to write down exactly in the thermodynamic limit that the partition function for this case that by definition is equal to the sum over all possible configurations of exponential of minus beta h of sigma for the fully connected Dyson model, where this guy has two to the n terms. So when n grows, this is a lot of terms. Do you agree with me? So I managed to trade off having a very complicated sum by having just a double integral. So this is equal to a double integral for m, m hat of the exponential of minus, of the exponential of m, a function that depends on m and m hat, where well, this function of m, m hat is equal once more to 
beta j divided by 2 m square uh, plus i m hat m plus the logarithm of 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of beta h minus i m hat. So why, why do we do what we do? Okay, it's not that we want to torture ourselves. It's again, I manage to, uh, to transform a very complicated object in its evaluation to a double integral. But not only that, look at the double integral. It's the double integral of the exponential of something that grows with the system size. So I, I don't even have to do the integral, right? So that means that in the limit when n goes to infinity, the synthetic behavior of this is exponential of n f evaluated at the side point. That's why, we, that's why we do what we do. All these manipulations that we do in the derivation and we start complicated things is to achieve, is to is try to achieve that we can write the partition function of this as, as an integral of a few objects with an exponential that has something that grows with the system size. Very good. Questions? Do we have an interpretation of m hat? Interpretation of m hat is a variable, it's a, it's a conjugate variable that forces the magnetization to take a given value. Because it comes from the free representation of the Dirac delta. Go ahead. Sorry? Uh, 2 pi over n, thank you, thank you. Sorry. Very good, very good. You know, you cannot miss anything now, right now, okay? For, for you, all terms are possibly relevant. <laughs> very good. What else? So, can we include the n as the term minus log n over n in the n function and say this just Sorry? Can we include this 1 over n, uh, you just added by the other one, as a term log n? Yeah. Yeah. Extract n to write it in the Very good. Way. And then you have log n divided by n. When n goes to infinity, it's, it goes to zero. Uh, yes. Yeah. Exactly. For instance. Um, or even, and then we just said we include it in the f function. Let us do it. N. Let us do it. It's a constant, but maybe it's a yes. constant that. Well, first of all, it's a constant. So, because it's just log of n, it does not depend on the integration variables, so it's not going to change uh, the result of the solid point. But assume that maybe it changes the value of the free energy, even though this doesn't matter because free energy, absolute, of, absolute values of free energies are not important, difference of free energies are important. But let us say, uh, let, let us say that you want to do the derivation carefully. Yeah? So yeah, so we can include it here, and then we'll do this. So when n goes to infinity, it goes to zero. This is what you were, what you were asking? Yeah. Yeah. But the point, yeah, yeah. But you see, uh, what was your name, sorry? Daniel. Daniel. So the, the point is like to keep track of these terms is important. Because in the second mapping we discuss of the having the uh, ge moment generating function of the, the number of eigenvalues to the left of, of x, now the replica limit, instead of going to zero, goes to something, an imaginary number. And in some cases, those terms that you thought were irrelevant, now it be, they become relevant. So it's very important for you to keep track of all, of all these that, in this case, are irrelevant terms. More questions? What time is it? Ah, fuck. So when, what you just said is that when we are not going to take the standard point that the n is going to infinity, we need to fix this. Well, if you don't want to take uh, n going to infinity, so then you have to reevaluate the derivation you, you have done because you threw away terms which were ordered n to the zero. Yeah? And maybe, and the, 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 but, this is what's, guys. But, so, but in the example that you were talking about, we are going to take the. Yeah, 
In this case, yes. But in some cases, you, you want to take into account corrections to the saddle points due to the f uh, finiteness of the, the, the fact that the system might be finite. And you have to take into account all those terms and do perturbation theory. Now, before we leave, right, so OK, now is this trick now understood? So you understand now the spirit, uh, the spirit of this trick. And it's always, always like this. It doesn't matter the object, right? So now, let us go back to the, to the expression that we have. Once more, OK? So for the spectral density of the average spectral density of Poissonian graphs, or the Erdos-Renyi graph, at some point we have, after doing the partition function to the power n, an average over um, the, 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 the Poissonian graph, I have this. No, I have the integral over i, the product of i from 1 to n. No, I'll put it like this. The product alpha from 1 to n, d n vector x alpha of, once again, the exponential of minus z divided by 2, the sum alpha from 1 to n, the sum i from 1 to n uh, of um, x i alpha square. Plus, let me put it here, d divided by 2. Sorry, I'm a bit tired already. Yeah, OK. The sum i and j from 1 to n divided by n, right? Of uh, ba, 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 the exponential of x vector i, scalar product x vector j, the vectors in the replica space minus 1, right? It's, it's, it's OK, I'm a bit tired already. I, I think that's, that expression is fine, right? So what I have here is a double sum in the variables. I want, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get the thermodynamic limit. So if I manage to put this double sum as a single sum, I can factorize per node. Yeah? And I, can, I will get to an expression where I can apply the Savel point method. So now, it doesn't matter that now for this trick that you are in the replica space. It doesn't matter that you have something here that is very weird. You have an exponential inside an exponential, right? It doesn't matter at all. The trick is the same in, in a spirit. In its soul, you know, it's the same trick. The only thing you have to learn is how to, what do I have to introduce to linearize this? Cool? Now, the object I have to introduce in the same manner that, that in the fully connected IC model, I have to introduce this magnetization, that by the way is the order parameter that tells you the transition in a critical point. Here, the object I have to introduce is this one. P sigma is equal to 1 over n, sum i from 1 to n of, uh, sorry, Px, right? The Dirac delta of x minus x. I. I introduce this. I can write this thing in terms of this object. And now I, I use a Dirac delta to tell this expression that this object that I, have, I have introduced is equal to this. Go ahead. Ah, it's kind of funny. OK. It's kind of funny. So if you go back, do I have time still? Can I have five more minutes? Yeah? It's kind of funny. So, so the trick we did before, I'll do this thing differently to realize that it's kind of funny. Very good, very good. This is excellent. So you see, I have. Yeah, so I have um, the double sum for i and j from 1 to n of sigma i, sigma j before. And the way I went to linearize this thing is to, it was to introduce 2m. But let's do it a bit differently, which is the trick you are going to use there. Right? So I can say, ah, this, I can write it as the sum over a specific uh, is invariable tau of the sum i j 1 n tau sigma j 
Kronecker delta, tau, sigma i. Yeah? Where the, now this is a Kronecker delta. Why? Because if I do the sum over tau, I substitute here tau by sigma i. Yeah? Now I can do the same thing for the other variable. Yeah? So this is equal now to the sum over tau, taking values minus 1, 1. Let's say now tau prime of the sum over i and j from 1 to n of tau times tau prime, Kronecker delta tau sigma i, Kronecker delta tau uh, sigma, tau prime sigma j. So before what I did is it was introduced the magnetization. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to, I'm going to linearize with a more complicated object, but this object is the one you, you will do here. You see? This is going to appear naturally here as well. So now this is equal to what? It's equal to, I can do the following. So I have the sum over tau, over tau prime, tau, tau prime, and then this is a double sum, complete double sum, right? So the sum over i, I put it with this guy, and the sum over j, I put it with the other guy. So I have sum over i from 1 to n, Kronecker delta tau sigma i, times the sum for j from 1 to n, Kronecker delta tau prime sigma j. Right. And if I divide by n here, and I put here an n, n square, What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is a, is a distribution, no? It tells you, it goes by nodes, and it tells you how many nodes are in, a, in the configuration tau. So this, you can call it if you want, P of tau. This would be the same function, but for P of tau prime. And then you will introduce a direct delta for the object, instead of to the magnetization, but you know, at the end, it is the same trick. So here, introducing this object to linearize is not relevant because what you introduce to linearize is the expectation value with respect to this object. But in this case, you have to introduce this object directly. More questions? More questions? Okay. <laughs> Shall we continue tomorrow? No, no, I, there's coffee break, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, you know. <coughs> so, ah, by the way, uh, tomorrow, I, I need to confirm you, but tomorrow I'm going to switch the, 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 the lectures with, uh, with, with Juan. Juan would be the first, I'll be the second. Okay, thank you.